Thank you again. Um, so, like uh, Steve said, I, I am an architect. So far, none of the presenters have said, how many architects do we have in the room? So I've gotten to kind of sit quietly in the, in the back of the spaces. But I am really excited to be here because most of my learning happens from hanging out with people like you. So being in a conference full of educators is like my favorite conference I've been in the last five years. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Um, like I said, uh, I've got a confession that I am an architect. I'm not an educator. There's no PhD behind my name. Uh, but I am extremely passionate about um, helping better align space with educational and instructional models that are trying to happen within that space. Because all too often, we talk to educators and they're like, you know, we just got a new school and they didn't talk to the educators and it's really not supporting what we're trying to do. So uh, I want to start my story with an experience that happened about three years ago. Uh, we were hosting a think tank out in the Bay Area for a new kind of school and we brought in some really wonderful thinkers from RISD and Rice University and Steelcase up in Grand Rapids uh, to help us kind of conceive what everyone's dream school might look like. And as a, as a warm up exercise, uh, we kind of went around the room and said, you know, everybody kind of describe your most powerful learning memory from your childhood. And by, you know, as I thought more about it, my most powerful learning experience as a kid had nothing to do with the classroom. And it really didn't have anything to do with school, sadly. And I kind of owe an apology to all my teachers because my most powerful learning experiences were out in the woods, exploring nature, building things, you know, around our house near the lake, a couple hours outside of Kansas City. Because um, you see, my dad was also an architect, and he was a builder, and he was an educator who taught architecture. And so these are a couple of the houses that he built for us. And, and it's the setting of these houses where I have my most powerful memories as a kid. And also learned kind of the, the, the love of building uh, from him. And you know, you would think that the best thing that you get out of your dad building a new house is a new house at the end. But the best thing you actually get is this. For an unsupervised kid, this is like a dream come true. And so I would often help myself to the boxes and boxes of nails and, and the scrap lumber. And I would put together these constructs out, out where people weren't paying attention. Um, and, and constructs is kind of code word for crap because I, <laughs> I, I should say I took a lot of risks and, and had a lot of failures. But it, it really helped me um, develop this love of, of kind of um, designing the, my immediate environment and how that could kind of shape and transport you and transport your mindset to another place. And so I, I didn't have any photos of these constructs because again, they were like all unsupervised and nobody really knew about them, but I found these. And you can tell that these transports didn't always end well because if you look closely at the picture on the left, I'm actually on crutches <laughs> at age seven. This was the third time I was on crutches in my life, <laughs> which might explain why I wasn't the favorite child of my parents, because it caused them a lot of agony. But what I lacked in um, building skills, I made up for with an, a powerful imagination. And then the image on the right is something that my dad made me. I didn't have that kind of craftsmanship abilities. But we called it the cube. It was a design he'd pulled you know, from Scandinavia. And I literally spent hours and hours in this thing, you could put blankets over it, you could kind of shift the shelves around. And, and you know, it, was a, it was a great place to help me focus and help me concentrate. And so I became very aware, um, looking back, not at the time, but looking back, uh, I was very conscious of, of that environment around me and how shaping it and customizing it could really help uh, kind of extend your concentration and your focus. So fast forward uh, 20 years later, I'm an architect, I've got my license, and I'm introduced to Universal Design, which Universal Design started as a program for the built environment to help make facilities and sites more accessible for all users of all ability levels. Uh, there are seven primary principles to it, and I think it's important to, to just reference this because this is kind of the origins of UDL, Universal Design for Learning, started with architecture in the built environment. 
So all of this is kind of the foundation for where I'm at today. Um, Gould Evans is a national design practice. We're not the biggest school design firm, but um, we really love uh, working with clients that have a special vision and kind of the understanding that you all bring about how space really matters and they know they're not gonna get a, a prototype off the shelf school uh, when we work with them. Our studio is made up of really naturally curious people that are constantly uh, focused on how to better align learning space with instructional models that are happening within. And to kind of further differentiate the way we practice, um, I co-founded um, a experimental learning space in our office four years ago. We call it STEAM Studio. And my fellow co-founder is a professor of education at Rockhurst University in Kansas City. And so every day, we've got students coming into our architectural space, uh, mostly third through eighth graders, kind of rubbing shoulders with architects and designers, marketing professionals, planners. And if you talk to their coaches and their teachers about kind of the shift in their behavior when they walk in our space, it's pretty amazing. There's a, a, an immediate kind of increase in, in maturity and accountability. Um, there's a strong sense of self-regulation. They're able to kind of watch the professionals in the space and, and, and kind of look at us as role models. You know, we don't raise our hands to go get a pair of scissors or get supplies. And so that's how they learn to kind of operate in STEAM Studio. And this has kind of become um, the, the premise for which uh, we really kind of do a lot of research and, and walk a day in the life of educators, which is incredibly humbling. And I could never do what you all do on a day-to-day -day basis because it's, it's far too exhausting for me. <laughs> but it gives me a great appreciation. And we have had so many questions about the impacts that um, Steam Studio is having that we uh, put together a book um, last year that uh, embodies a lot of our research and a lot of research that's happening throughout the country on education and effect of uh, teaching and learning practices on academic outcomes. And I don't say this to, to promote the book, even though you can find it in the, in the bookstore, but I say it because this is where our point of view really comes from. Our point of view comes from um, more of a live experience uh, working with teachers. And it's not just with, um, with Steam Studio, but some other processes that we do. But, you know, this really brings me to my great dream. You know, as, as an architect, I'm absolutely biased <laughs> about the role of space design. But I believe that design has the power to really help kids kind of reclaim that, that curiosity and that love of learning that we all had as young kids. And I believe it can really play a role in giving students a sense of dignity at school, all students. I believe in the right environment, students can kind of reclaim that creative genius that tends to get lost as you come up through the school, different school years. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's where we come from. And, and we know that to kind of continue to better understand the correlation between design and learning models, we've got to do a lot more than what we're doing in our own office. So we do a lot of post-occupancy studies. We spend a lot of time going back to our projects a year or two later after they've been using them for a while. And we talk to students, teachers, administrators, parents. And then we do some good old fashioned ethnography because what people say they do in a space isn't always what they actually do in the space, which is an interesting phenomenon in itself. And it was during one of these uh, visits that I had a real aha moment um, just a few years ago. We uh, had come back to kind of study how some learning centers were operating in uh, the Milpitas School District out in California. And we were kind of waiting for the next class to come in. And within seconds, these kids kind of came in and made a beeline to their favorite piece of furniture, where they like to work. Some were tucked in the corners, some were out in the middle of the room, some were with friends, some were by themselves, and they were reconfiguring it and making their own space. And this is exactly what I did as a kid, except I couldn't do it at school. I had to do it off in the secrecy <laughs> of the woods. And, and so, you know, this kind of gave me a, a renewed inspiration for what, what space can do. And, and mind you, these kids were not losing 
much time at all in this process of reconfiguring their space. It literally took seconds. And then if you watch their engagement level afterwards, they were in the zone. I mean, they, they were at the top of the charts from a student engagement standpoint. So here's my, my call to action for everybody here. And Joni, Joni, you're definitely on the same theme with this. Um, I want you all to leave this conference really understanding that your space is a behavior role model for all the people using it. That it needs to be a reflection of who you really are and who you aspire to be. And I'm not alone in this, this belief that, that space can really uh, inspire and, and transform behaviors. Uh, Chris Fink, who's a founding faculty member at D School, kind of said a lot more eloquently than I did. He said that space is the body language of an organization. And that he goes on to say that, intentional or not, the form, functionality, and finish of a space reflect the culture, the behaviors, and the priorities of the people within it. That's a bit of a mouthful, but if we focus on that one term of culture that Joni was speaking to, and we tie that to the notion that culture will trump strategy every day, then we all need to be mindful that our spaces are affecting behaviors. Behaviors over time will affect culture. And if our culture isn't aligned with the strategies that we're designing through our UDL efforts, we're gonna be fighting an uphill battle. It's gonna be like discordant music. Your space and your learning models are not gonna be harmonizing together. So we've put together a toolkit to um, make it easier for all of you that may not yet speak the language of space. Um, great collaboration with Steve and, and Jamie and uh, Sue and Brian uh, to kind of take the guidelines and use those to create a series of ideas, idea cards, uh, that all relate to different aspects of how we can all think about space design. Um, it's intended to be real simple. It's intended to take the mystique out of space design and make everybody fluent in that language of architecture. And so these two are something that we'll have available today and at the bookstore. But, you know, it's, it's just an idea kit. You know, as a newcomer to UDL myself, I can find the guidelines a little overwhelming, um, a little academic. And again, as an architect, you know, I wanna really kind of keep things simple, keep things visual. So these are something that you can, uh, you know, pin on your wall as reminders or something you can use with building administrators or district officials saying space is critically important. We really need to be thinking about it. And to go through just a few of these, um, to give you an idea of the flavor, um, you know, this, this first notion of allowing students to make space, I think, is really critical in a lot of ways. You know, it's going to touch on those guidelines about optimizing individual choice and autonomy. It's going to talk about minimizing threats and distractions. It's going to talk about fostering collaboration and community, among other things. So this is a really easy place to start, a good entry point. The idea of uh, really embracing uh, fidgeting and movement, not only really speaks to minimizing distractions for kids, but it also really stimulates those neural connections in the brain and helps kids pay attention longer. If you get a chance to, to test drive with some of the furniture out here that Norva Nivel's got and stand on those huddle boards during a session, those things are amazing. And they're amazingly simple, but they're amazingly effective. Um, you know, what we found in STEAM Studio is the fact that uh, the better we can manage tools and resources, make them visually accessible and physically accessible to students, the more we can really develop uh, self-regulated learners, that they can get up and access things when they need them and give them the freedom to move at their pace. Um, we also talked about this, this idea of a learning prototype studio. This is an idea that came to us from a, one of the teachers that we work with in STEAM Studio. And she said, we're using our makerspace as kind of a demo lab for our teachers. So not only to work together with other teachers, but work basically doing professional development live with their students, but it's in an environment that's, that encourages risk and failure so the teachers don't need to 
be as concerned about the, the fears of failing in front of their students. And then they can take these ideas back to the classroom with more confidence. And then the last one uh, is um, a series of images all from one classroom. Um, this is from one of our UDL rock stars up in Michigan who teaches seventh grade language arts. And she, uh, I'm, I'm so impressed with how Tanya runs 150 students through this classroom every day. And it's got a lot of different settings in it so her kids can simultaneously do collaborative storytelling or work alone on writing or reading skills. Um, and again, she kind of professes that they don't lose a lot of time. They spend a day up front in the semester kind of orienting kids to the space and let them figure out how to use it. And then it's, it's doing nothing but kind of magnifying uh, their efforts um, through the rest of the year. So I want to finish with a favorite quote of mine from Sir Ken Robinson. Um, he writes that to grow a healthy plant, we don't graft limbs and leaves onto it, but we nourish it by optimizing its environment. And that's what we need to do in our learning environments with our students. So that's what I've got for you today. Uh, we are running a breakout session at 1.15, which I encourage um, some of you to attend that you can be our beta testers uh, for the idea kits. We're gonna break some of those out. And if you wanna join us, we'll deal you in. So I hope to see you there. Thank you.